Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our third uh, webinar organized uh, by the King's Japan program. My name is Alessio Patlano and I'm reading uh, uh, East Asian Warfare and Security at the Department of War Studies. Um, today, I am delighted to welcome back, door virtually, I have to say, um, Sheila Smith uh, from the Council of Foreign Relations. Um, and we are back together because, as I've made a point over the last couple of webinars, it's always good during a period of social distancing and lockdown to have a book ready close at your hands to read, to enjoy, and to learn something new. And today we're going to be talking about Sheila's latest book, which certainly ticks all these pocket boxes and some more. In particular, um, what I am very pleased with is that over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about how the Indo-Pacific as a concept, as a framework, um, is highlighting the importance within or under the broader umbrella of major power competition, the importance and the contribution of actors other than the major powers to regional dynamics. Within this context, today's discussion is extremely timely because it allows us to engage with Japan, an actor that has changed incredibly um, and that under its own version of an Indo-Pacific concept has expanded and reached out uh, in economic, political and military terms in particular over the last decade under the leadership of Shinzo Abe. And certainly um, this book is timely and it allows us to engage with this question and see both the highlights of the Abe legacy as well as some of the shadows and the sort of uh, um, unanswered questions uh, that his role is brought about. And I am pleased to say that few people could be a, sort of more, a better place to, to, to talk uh, to us about this. Um, she needs no introduction. Her work at the Council of Foreign Relations is well known. Um, her last book, Intimate Rivals, was uh, an absolutely fascinating sort of um, journey into the meanings, the different meanings and the depth uh, that are behind Japan's China policy. So today I am particularly pleased to welcome her back to talk about Japan rearmed. Sheila, um, without any further ado, please um, do tell us more about the book. Before I do so, so uh, let me uh, um, sort of make a one quick point. Um, we are going to be sort of organizing the webinar as usual, 20, 25 minutes remarks, then followed by uh, question answers. Um, you see your question answers tab at the bottom of the screen. Please click on it and start typing in uh, whenever uh, you feel to ask something. Sheila, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. Excellent, Alessio. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be back at King's College. And even if it's virtually, I'm delighted to be, have the chance to talk with you. Uh, your writing and work on Japanese maritime strategy and, and Japan's foreign policy writ large has been on my bookshelf for some time and I always, always enjoy the conversation. So let me just say a little thing, a, a little intro about the book for those of you listening who haven't had a chance to read it yet. Um, I wrote it largely because I've been looking at Japanese self-defense force and thinking about this dilemma uh, for policymakers in Tokyo. Um, the dilemma between conforming to the spirit of Article 9 of the post-war constitution, which we all know was imposed by General MacArthur during the U.S. occupation way back when, um, but also being an ally of the United States in the Cold War and the post-Cold War world actually being in one of the most important and changing geostrategic environments in, uh, in the globe, I would say. So Japan has had to wrestle with both its post-war identity as a state that wanted great power status, but without putting its military prowess at the forefront of its statecraft. In fact, the military was way back in the list of instruments uh, that Japan uh, could draw on. That being said, though, the debate over the, you know, even during the Cold War, but in the aftermath of the Cold War, the debate largely focused on this kind of dichotomy between thinking about Japan as a pacifist nation or a militarist nation. Um, and it did not, I think, dig down deeply for policymakers on, well, what are the framing, what are the variables? What are the pressures, the influences, the pulls and the tugs on the policy making process? And how do they work their way through as we see a Japan that is increasingly willing to embrace this military as an instrument of statecraft? And as you said, Alessio, you can see it more and more in the Asia Pacific. Uh, it is also welcomed and that's the other side of the coin. This is not just Japanese thinking is changing. Regional thinking is also changing about the need for and receptivity to the Japanese as a military power. 
uh, in coalition with other powers. So, so the book for me is, uh, this is decades of, of thinking for those of you who might be in the audience who are struggling with PhD dissertations. Uh, this began <laughs> way back when, when I wrote my PhD at Columbia and I was doing the same thing. I was looking at this tug and pull between limitation, domestic political limitation at home, and also this tug and pull of the United States and the alliance expectations of Japan. Um, the book is largely about the post-Cold War period, right? So I have an introductory chapter about the Cold War and what happened, um, but it really walks through the post-Cold War. So the last 30 years or so of, of transformation for Japan. Um, the other piece of the puzzle that's important for those of you who don't know me as well, um, I work in the Council on Foreign Relations. I live in Washington, DC. I was there at the moment of the crisis between Japan and China over the Senkaku Islands. So the first fishing trawler incident with the Japanese Coast Guard in 2010, and then again when it really became much, much more of a, of a state to state um, uh, contest in 2012. Um, and what was um, interesting to me is we have such a deep integrated military to military relationship, the United States and Japan. We've got generations of military officers who've served together, right? My father, for example, was a naval officer in the Pacific for most of his career. Um, we've got deep integration of alliance managers, what we call alliance managers, so state, Department of Defense, National Security Council, and yet even people who are well-versed in the region and well-versed in Japan we're having trouble thinking about when and how Japan might response to, respond to this increasing pressure from China over its own territory, right? So there were questions in there for the alliance. There were questions in there about predicting the Japanese willingness to use force in a territorial challenge. Um, there were questions about how the alliance might organize itself better, not necessarily to fight back, but to prevent testing of the military alliance in the way that China was clearly testing um, Japan. And, and that continued and continues today. So there was, a, there was a need, I think, for our policymakers to have a little bit of a step back and say, well, what are the variables? What are the political context, but also how are the SDF themselves? thinking about their mission and how has that changed over time. So that was an audience I was particularly aware of when I sat down to write the book. I don't know how much you want the, the conclusion, but in the fast forward version of this presentation, there are four chapters really, one that deals with the SDF going abroad, which was largely begun in the PKO, but continues to extend. Um, there's a really rich chapter on mobilizing for self-defense, for territorial defense, which we can talk more about, I'm sure. Um, there's a chapter about the Constitution and that large meta-narrative, and it's particularly uh, poignant today because, of course, Abe Shinzo is prime minister and he feels very strongly about the need to uh, revise the Japanese Constitution, to put a Japanese imprimatur on that document. But the final chapter is the chapter I entitled Borrowed Power, which is how does, a, how does Japan, as a US ally, seek to engage with our military power? How does it try to shape our thinking about the use of that military power? And there's some interesting issues on the table today. You know, medium range uh, missiles, intermediate range missiles in the region, for example, that missile gap that Japan feels acutely because it doesn't have that kind of capability. Um, so there's many dimensions of Japanese policymaking that I, I separate out into these separate um, chapters. The conclusion, though, for those of you who want to understand, is Japan coming? <laughs> is Japan expanding in Asia? My answer is no. The changing threat perception, we all know it. It's the rise of China. It's the ambitions of uh, North Korea for a nuclear capability and a deliverable nuclear capability with its missiles, missile arsenal. Um, threat perception alone is not going to move Japan out of its post-war strategic inclination, which is alliance with the United States and limiting uh, military power to the mission of self-defense or national security. Um, what will move Japan out of the box, I conclude, is should the alliance no longer be viable, should no longer be reliable. And we can talk about what conditions I think that might tease through the policymaking process. But Japan has never had to think about the possibility that the United States might say one day, you know, you should go it alone to quote a president at the moment. <laughs> or, you know what? I don't care if North Korea has short, medium range missiles. We don't really care. That's your problem, Japan, right? So there's all, all kinds of variants here, whether you could see the United States walking back its, its commitment to defending and 
deterring aggression against Japan. And that I think is the very critical variable uh, for real transformation in Japanese strategic outlook. Let me stop there. Sorry, I could go on forever. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. I mean, there's, there's a lot there. Um, I, I for one, um, have quite a few questions, uh, but perhaps uh, present them more as an opportunity to uh, elaborate some of the very good points you were raising. Um, I couldn't agree with you more than, than one of the key issues um, that even if it is a short chapter, but you, you kind of like laid out quite nicely, uh, the relationship between Cold War and post-Cold War is quite important because um, there is a lot of assumption about what Japan was not doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we need to go back and understand the, the, the parameters, you know, the, the, to make a distinction between the mythology of Cold War Japan and the reality of Cold War Japan. Because without that, uh, then it's very difficult to see what is changing, what is not changing. And, and I think that comes across very strongly in, in, in the book. Um, if I were to sort of um, look at the various chapters and sort of highlight one area, what I thought certainly the other years have made a contribution in that sort of change, not only in terms of uh, using the self-defense forces and Japanese military power, but also changing the public perception in Japan uh, about the self-defense forces. It's really the reintegration of military power uh, within the tools of statecraft, particularly in foreign and security policy. Uh, not as a war fighting or just uh, HADR, Type of contribution, but as as as, a, as an integrated tool. And you know, interestingly, you know, Minister Connor, having been Minister of Foreign Affairs, and when he was a Minister of Foreign Affairs, he would always reference how economic, foreign policy, and security matters were all going hand in hand. Now he's a Defence Minister, and he continues to work along those sort of concepts. And so, if I were to take one thing away from 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 the various sort of elements of 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 of, of the book. Perhaps is really this idea of uh, the role of military power in foreign policy uh, that has changed. And I wonder whether you would agree that that perhaps could be seen as one of Abe's uh, more important contribution, both in terms of the ability to create institutional reforms in Japan to allow that to happen, um, and in terms of creating awareness of the importance of doing it. But at the same time, even though now the institutions are there, the consciousness is there, I've always wondered, will it last once Abe sort of steps down? Will we, uh, will be we looking at a Japan that in, in, in which military power is more reintegrated into foreign policy as a standard, as a new normal? Or was this like a very long bleep that depending on who's the lead, the, the, will no longer materialize once it's gone. Right. Thank you, Alyssa. The great, great comments and, and, and questions as well. Um, let me try to answer your second. I, I also felt that the Cold War setup was really critical because a lot of people just didn't understand, you know, just exactly what the self-defense forces were doing or what the Japanese themselves wanted the self-defense forces to be doing. And of course, the civilian control debate that was so much a part of the politics was, was huge there. Um, you know, I was lucky in a way because I got to be, I was in Tokyo when the first Gulf War happened. So this is 1990-91. And I was working at JAIA, Japan Institute for International Affairs. And that was the one of the major, as you know, one of the major foreign policy think tanks run by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so when the United States began asking for Japanese contributions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, a, a SDF, this is pre-Armitage, you know, Secretary, Deputy Secretary Armitage's boots yes. on the ground phrase. But, but that's kind of what they want. They wanted a military component because they wanted this transformative coalition in the post-Cold War era to be the U.S. and its allies or like-minded partners. It was very early in that, right? Um, and I can remember going to conferences and um, where it was about the U.S.-Japan alliance. And the MOFA guys did not want the SDF in the, in the group. They just did not want them there. And they had long drinking sessions in the evening about, I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, let me give you some pre-war history. <laughs> so institutional memory lived long, even through 1990-91 about the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the, and the military, right? Uniform military. So there's a lot underneath the, underneath the surface here we could talk about. But let me address the Abe years, because I think it's really interesting. Um, I think the thing about Abe is, one is a kind of facilitative 
answer to your question, which is until you get Abe, who is supportive of the reinterpretation of the right of collective self-defense, he had been during his first time in office back in 2006, seven, and he had commissioned serious thinkers to say, we need to be able to use our self-defense force with the Americans and under what conditions do we, would that affect? Uh, Japanese security. So he had begun that kind of policy thinking process when he was first term uh, prime minister. Um, so you had a leader like that. Mm. Um, but the second thing you had is you had a legislative supermajority. Mm. They could do what they want. I mean, they still can in the lower house, as you know, right? So the kind of legislation needed to correct for that interpretation to mm. really put in place the policy mechanisms that would allow that reinterpretation to actually be implemented mm. couldn't happen without that two thirds majority and yeah. without a fairly sens uh, sympathetic Kome party ruling coalition elite. So the thing about Abe is yes, he had these focal, this, he had his attention on some of these critical security reforms, many of them at, right out of the box, that first or second year, right? A national mm -hmm. security strategy, a secrecy law, went on later to be a conspiracy law, right? All of this ticking the box across new guidelines, et cetera. Um, many of those things were teed up. They weren't all about Abe, but he had that political capacity to get it all done. And he had the political will to get it done. That's, that was his agenda. That's what he wanted. And frankly, the Japanese public by then, which is always the important you know, backdrop to thinking about this. The Japanese public by then were quite comfortable with the idea that Japan needed to step up its game mm. uh, for Japanese defenses. So if you look at um, opinion polling, Asahi, Yomiuri, so right, left, leaning, right, you'll get the same answer. Yeah. Not necessarily about constitutional revision, but about defense perceptions. You'll get the same answer about Japan's need to contend with a more aggressive China, and an increasingly worrisome North Korea. So Abe had a lot of things going for him, including his own interest and his own ability to pull the security reforms forward in the way that we watched him do so successfully. Um, but the Japanese public was also quite ready uh, to be sure that you know Japan was going to be able to defend itself. And again, remember, he came back in December of 2012 which is the year of the most uh, difficult clash with China over the Senkaku Islands. So you've got a worried public at the same time in a way I think you really hadn't with any previous leader. Now you asked me about, well, what happens now post Abe? And well, one of the greatest in innovations and from the US-Japan Alliance point of view, one of the most effective uh, coordinating um, role pieces of the puzzle, in addition to all these other bigger changes, is the creation of the National Security the National Security Secretariat, right, which we sometimes call the National Security Council, but it's the NSS. And it began with Mr. Yachi, for, uh, former um, uh, advisor to, to candidate Abe, but also in the first uh, term of Abe's government, the author of that report on collective self-defense. So somebody Abe knew and trusted and had very similar kinds of ambitions for Japan's strategic shift. He was at the head of it, right? Mm -hmm. Very influential diplomat, very influential uh, po political advisor, uh, but very astute strategist at the same time. And then they built this organization that integrated the bureaucracies that had the tension I was alluding to at the beginning. You had the best and the brightest from MOFA, the best and the brightest from the Ministry of Defense by this time, right? You had the best and the brightest from the self-defense forces. So now you've got uniformed personnel coming into that advisory body, right, for the first time integrated into the policy process. You also had police and to a lesser extent you had METI, the economic uh, team. Um, so it was a new institutional policy engine for a lot of the kinds of changes that we saw under Abe. That's my question about the future. Is it institutionalized? Will it still be used by whoever comes as prime minister, whether it's Konotaro or Kishida or whoever may, you know, and that's going to be important because whether they see that as an asset for them as they lead Japan in this particular moment of Asia's geopolitics will depend on whether they use it and whether it's still seen by the bureaucrats as the right place for them to be to, to affect policymaking. So I think it's a great, excellent question. I can't answer it, but I think the NSS and the institutionalization of some of these reforms is really pretty key. But, but I think you touched on, 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 you know, on, on the critical aspect here, the, the question of uh, how the perception of the level of institutionalization of the NSS 
will then last long after Arab is gone. Um, in, in comparative terms, even for a medium size sort of, uh, for a country with a medium size sort of uh, civil service or, or bureaucratic establishment, if you compare it to the UK, um, the Japanese NSS is relatively small in terms of the number of people fielding it. Um, but there was a, a certainly under a perception that needs to have more people precisely to be able to create that sense of institutional gravitas that is essential to make it last. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right. That, that's, a, that's a key question. And um, also the other point you were making about how the, the NSS not only is becoming a centralizing factor that highlights the importance of coordinating different aspects, including military matters into foreign policy, which is very important, um, but also physically. Basically, in some cases, you have the MOD out, out uh, numbering other institutions by factor of one, because if you have one director of office and two deputy directors, you've got three people. In some cases, you've got one civilian MOD, one military uh, from the SDF, and one person from MOFA or METI. Um, so, so you have a, a progressive reintegration, physical reintegration of personnel into these things. I want to go, and I'm, I'm going to ask you this just because of, it's a naughty question. Um, because now that, that you know, we know, we know that Yachi, uh, was, as you said, an astute strategist, um, a diplomat, a person with a strong view on international affairs. And it is fair to say, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it is fair, I think it is fair to say that he was one of the persons that shaped the way the other government approached China, international relations, and certainly between him and, and, and Kanehara, you can have a powerful combo that really gave a sense of, 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 of thrust that we've seen in the past few years to other. But of course now, Yanchi has stepped down and he's been replaced by someone who comes from the police, um, who has been there at the NSS since the, its inception. But I wonder um, whether it would extend that change in this critical position um, actually might impact how the NSS sees itself within the economy of the Japanese sort of bureaucratic establishment or government establishment, as it were. And therein lies the question about the institutionalization is, as you know, like every government everywhere, right? Personalities matter, right? Who the prime minister turns to when he needs advice matters. Which institution is stronger, the informal National Security Council in the United States or the Secretary of Defense's office? We've had our share of severe bureaucratic battles over the decision making for our strategy as well. So this is not just a Japan issue, this is all of our governments have this challenge. Personalities do matter. Mm. And, you know, early teams and then later teams, the longer Abe stays in office, right? The, the you know, poor Yachi-san didn't get to retire for a long time, right? Yeah. Um, but it does, it does sort of bring up the possibility that this bureaucratic tug and pull, which is not far under the surface in any government, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think they always rule the day, but it will depend on strong political management from the Kante mm -hmm. and the population also. We talked about NSS, but there's also the Kante itself, right? Which is where Mr. Kanehara was, right? Mm -hmm. um, so whoever comes in will have to build a structure that he or potentially she, but we don't have a she candidate at the moment in Japan, I think. But what they, they must have a vision and then they must think about the implementation of that vision. And I think that's the big challenge for the post Abe era. We could have a, a shorter time frame of a lame duck kind of Abe, uh, which we're, we may be looking at now. Um, I don't know. Um, his approval rating has taken a hit from the COVID-19, and it's surprising because it, Japan is turning out to have navigated the storm reasonably well. Um, maybe not with all the bells and whistles of Taiwan or South Korea, right? But, but certainly, certainly well compared to many European countries or obviously mm -hmm. us, right? But he's not, that's not redounding in his favor. He's had some real pushback and uh, his disapproval rate has gone way up. Mm -hmm. So you could have a period at the end of the Abe cabinet even mm. where this, you know, the, the, the integration of the policy mechanisms with a larger strategic vision and loyalty to the prime minister, that those variables are all starting to dissipate somewhat. And I, you know, I, I think that um, Japan is not alone in having its bureaucratic politics, but the, the grasp of certain bureaucracies of the Kante and of political potential successors to Abe, that, that battle is ongoing, I, mm. without a doubt. I have no particular evidence to share with you, <laughs> but I, we all know that, it's, that these, these wheels will be turning already, mm. right? 
Um, so you may get a little pushback on some of these issues. Hmm. On the other hand, Chinese behavior is not, right? It's not conducive to people who say, oh, let's be a little bit more <laughs> uh, quiet or calm about our, our use of the military instrument. The Chinese are, if not ramping up, they are certainly keeping the pressure up across Asia. Uh, so I don't see that anybody coming in as a likely successor will really pull back mm. a lot from the foundation that Abe has built. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it was interesting, the point you were making about the fact that even though Japan is doing relatively better than most European countries, uh, for example, and it is interesting, a very recent poll from a couple of days ago in Japan uh, was pointing out how people in Japan perceive that Japan is doing okay, but it's not thanks to uh, the government's action. <laughs> so, 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 so it's actually quite remarkable um, in that sense, how there is a lack of recognition that the government's um, behavior in, in the crisis has been up to, uh, up to the task. Um, and, and of course, the point you're making about, I think you know, if one were uh, slightly more cynical, you could say that one of the greatest gifts that, that Abe certainly has proved to have over the last, particularly when he returned to power in 2012, was to identify um, regional disturbances, whether it was a North Korean uh, nuclear uh, missile testing, whether it was China's behavior, it certainly managed to seize the initiative and bring security sort of uh, front and center to move the agenda of reforms, institutional reforms forwards. Um, and, and, and again, I think this is going to be crucial when whoever comes next, whoever has that sort of ability um, will probably manage to get more out of the current situation than not. And at the same time, I think, we're also the point you were making about others' uh, uh, continuous needs even though they had a pretty safe majority, but to remain in dialogue with its coalition partners, in particular Kumato, on matters of defense and security, I think it's been a fascinating development in the Japanese political sort of debating, because absent an opposition presenting valid case, mm. and I'm currently working on, on a project um, on the early Cold War stages where you read diet meetings um, and, and minutes whereby the Communist Party is talking about defense and security matters with a depth of knowledge, technical knowledge. Amazing. And you think this is the Japanese Communist Party, right? right. And the socialists, right? And I mean, right. Unbelievable. Uh, but at the same time, you don't see that kind of depth coming across in, in, in the past few years from the opposition. And I think in, in, in democracies, it's the tension between different parties that usually forces whoever is in power to come up with a better answer, or at least that's the idea. Um, and, but, but the negotiation and the activities with Comeiro, I think, have been a very, uh, an enlightening moment, if you want, of the, the last few years in terms of how defense and security had to be re-geared in a way, if that's the objective, how do we get there? We need to get our partners, in, in political partners, on board with it. So I, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but it seems to me that was a really fascinating development that, again, is very much of an ABBA era. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So Yamaguchi Natsu, the head of the Komei Party, came mm -hmm. to Washington when um, Abisan came back to government. And um, or maybe it was before that. It may have been a little bit before that. But uh, it was an interesting conversation because we, he gave a talk at Carnegie and we all went. And of course, I raised my hand. <laughs> Komedo, you know, when you're, you, you, you always talk about yourself, you as you in the campaign, we're talking about yourself as the Hadome, you know, the break, no, no, no. and the LDP, and on Abe in particular, right? Um, but now you're here in Washington, and you're actually advocating for Japan stepping up in the alliance. And I said, I just would like you to put those two pieces together. And of course, I know him well. And he kind of looked at me, goes, ha, Sheila. Mm. <laughs> and he said, I just want to remind the audience that every time there's been significant improvement in alliance security cooperation, Komeito was in partner with the LDP in government. And it's an interesting point, you know, if you wanted to go back and look at, right, Komeito at home has, of course, as you know, has its own, you know, its own constituencies, that, you know, that it must sort of continue to, to listen to. But it has been in coalition with the LDP on security policy. It has maybe played the role of the break Right, tempering some of the, the, the impulses of the Abe cabinet, to be sure, on the new security legislation. They pulled the Abe cabinet back from where it really wanted to go. Um, but that's a nice, interesting balancing act for a very small party 
right? For a very urban, non foreign policy, non security identified political party, right? So th there's times when politics doesn't require expertise at the, at the level of the technical details, and you can still be very influential over the outcome, right? But you, that period, that early period in Japanese diet debates is fascinating. As you pointed out, I just went. I just wrote an article for the Columbia Law Journal. Um, Columbia, th there was a big uh, constitutional revision, which I um, saw. I actually have yes, it. Yes. It's brilliant. Yes. I love it. it was a great one, and I couldn't actually attend the conference at the last minute because of a family emergency. But I did write the article with uh, for the journal, and because I had a piece that I wanted to get in the book, but I couldn't because it just didn't fit. You know where I this book, um, but it was on the 1954 Self Defense Force Law. Mm -hmm. And it was the very first time when Japan came out of occupation under Yoshida and Hatoyama and them were locking heads. Um, but it was really about, well, how do, what kind of military do we have? And mm -hmm. what does this military look like? It was the kind of moment of definition of how does Article 9 translate into our military? Um, fascinating stuff, but leftist socialists, rightist socialists, communist party members, all kinds of opinion in the LDP, deep split, or not the future LDP, it was gonna be the liberals and the Democrats. So you had a whole multitude of parties at the table. Fascinating. And the, you know, the thing, Alessio, that's so interesting though, a lot of the conversation is not that much different than the, 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 the tensions and the issues that still struggle, you know, the policymakers still struggle with today. But fascinating time in Japanese politics for looking at the security debates. So I congratulate you for going back and taking a look. Because it's I, you know, completely fun stuff, by, you know. By accident, I, I learned, I realized that in the sort of second half of the 60s, long before Nakasone and right. Esther about um, you know Japan's uh, uh, more sort of uh, more, more independent defense posture already in 66 67 there is a debate over whether Japan should acquire uh, nuclear powered uh, submarines and, and one of the things that struck me was the debate was not done in matters of principle as it's like that's just not possible period particularly on the sort of on the left it was argued on technical matters, on, 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 on opinions based on, on strategic It right. was absolutely incredible, the depth of, and, and the sort of the, the substance around the discussion. Um, and, and, and again, the critical voices coming from the Socialist Party and the Communist Party were absolutely essential in shaping up a debate which eventually led in 1971 to the discussion over what kind of defense posture and then the changes that we have in, in, in the first cycle. And right. in a way, if you don't go back to those debates in the 60s, um, you really miss out uh, the development of thinking around it and the institutional legacy within the various core parties over these issues. And, 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 and as a result of that, absolutely. I mean, a lot of those conversations are essential to understand where we are today and how similar they are in terms of dynamic. Now, Yes. There's, 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 um, there's a lot of people sort of starting to queue up with, with question. And, and um, I think it's time that we let others join the conversation. <laughs> um, Otherwise, we'll do this forever. <laughs> so I I this yeah, now that I have you, <laughs> we can carry on. Um, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a question, though. The first one that I have here, it's something also that I had down um, on, um, uh, uh, on, on my list of points to raise. Um, so first of all, um, in, in, is a question well, from someone who's, um, who's loving the discussion and is certainly going to buy the book. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mission accomplished. My son, my son can finish college. Thank you. <laughs> um, there, is, um, uh, there is a legitimate point about um, the, the sort of the power in the book where you talk about borrowed power. Yeah. And what is sort of what, lay, what, you know, what lies beyond, beyond the US Japan alliance? And you're making a point about how it is important at the moment for, for Japan to start considering what if um, the United States uh, knocks at your door and says, like, you know what, you, you may want to sort of look elsewhere because we're not really sure about the alliance as it is anymore. But at the same time, and, and the question here is very specific on. If you are looking at Japan as an international security actor out, from outside the United States, particularly if you're European or if you're in Australia, you have certainly witnessed a different kind of country. Right. There is a, a literature now that is starting to emerge about the diversification through the alliance. So the, sort of Japan is using 
the US-Japan alliance and its business card to diversify its opportunities with others, as it were. So the question is, uh, what do you think um, this new flurry of interactions, both diplomatic um, and defense related, and the question in particular uh, highlights the bilateral and trilateral link that has existed between UK and Japan and UK, Japan, US uh, in particular. What do you think this all means? If you were sitting here in London and you're looking at Japan and what's been happening, what do you think all this sort of flurry of activities mean in the long term? Has Japan become the sort of, what kind of actor is, if you want, from a UK perspective? And to what extent do you think that this um, diversification of interactions, both bilaterally with other countries, as well as through the United States with third parties, as the trilaterals, uh, UK, US, Japan, uh, what do these all mean for Japan and from a Japanese perspective? Are we likely to see more? Um, what can we expect? How can we expect these things to develop? Excellent question. Uh, it could, it deserves a book of its own, frankly, almost um, the diversification side. And when I was writing the book, I realized that, you know, there could be a whole chapter on that, but mm -hmm. it was evolving at the time I was writing. And so I, it was premature for this book. Um, let me try just to cursory kind of tackle that question as, as I see it. When, when we first started talking, when you first started asking the question about the borrowed power, right? Um, I thought we were heading for an extended deterrence conversation, right? Because a, a lot of what I started out conceptualizing that chapter to be about was really how does Tokyo influence the way in which America uses its strategic power, its offensive strike, its, its, its willingness to defend, its, its intercession with Beijing on Japanese behalf, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and we've got a lot of evidence already about what's been happening on that side and how much right Japanese thinking about using the alliance as a tool for Japanese security has evolved right in the post Cold War world. But what I think is fascinating about this bilateral trilateral that starts in Asia, but also has implications, I think, for European partners is that the US was critical at the beginning. Right. So you got the US, Japan, Australia, that trilat that very quickly, within a couple of years, turned into a Japan, Australia. You know, the United States wasn't missing in action, and it was still a very important backdrop, both, you know, for both allies, but it was such a, what it, it just transformed into such a, especially surveillance and information sharing and stuff like that, now a status of forces agreement, all kinds of stuff, that the Japanese and Australians can do together. Mm. Not without, in our absence, but they don't need us to be sitting at the table for it all to happen. And I think that's been really a transformative relationship. That's the kind of relationship I could envision for Japan, UK, right? Perhaps even Japan, France. Um, but, you know, for European NATO actors, because that foundation is there, right, of the integration of the United States and any kind of strategic concept of how to use force, right, going forward. Um, but you've also seen it US, Japan, India. Mm. Right, the Malabar exercises that you write about, the, the maritime presence is now a huge part of what the Japanese uh, are engaged in, right? It's not like they're going to go defend India, but <laughs> that presence, that signaling that they care about what's happening, right? Um, that's important. Another piece of that would be important for European actors as well. In fact, I think one of the pieces that I found most fascinating is the way in which the new sanctions against North Korea is being used as an opportunity to build those capacities and those presence kinds of opportunities, right? With the UK, with France, um, with Australia as well. I mean, the, the, what's going on in the East China Sea to monitor North Korean behavior has all kinds of actors that we wouldn't expect to be sitting down there in the East China Sea. But I think the presence piece where you want to demonstrate the norms, right? Freedom of navigation, maybe not quite yet, but at least freedom of the seas and the kinds of norms that you would like to see uh, globally uh, employed. I think the partners in Europe, uh, in particular the naval partners in Europe are, are somebody, are, are partners that Japan really would like to continue to encourage to show up in a Asia, but also maybe as a platform for Japan to move beyond the Indo-Pacific at some point. Um, so presence norms, right, is the second category. And the final category, and this is probably one of the more important ones, is technology. Mm. The Ministry of Defense, of course, now has ATLA. Uh, I always forget the full name, ATLA, what it stands for. <laughs> Acquisition, Acquisition and Technology, and the L I always forget, agency, right? 
but basically what it is, is for the first time, Japan has entered now into a Ministry of Defense sponsored uh, technologic acquisition of technology and leveraging of uh, Japanese technological capability for the purpose of military right, mm. strategic aims. And, you know, this is partly a response to demographics, right? Japan won't have billions of people in the future. So technology is, is a critical lever here. Um, but now Japan, the, the Japanese ministry really wants research and development, right? It wants its private sector to be, that's also including universities to be engaged in this, right? Um, it wants its private sector to be much more active in global arms sales and defense technology, right? Uh, purchase and acquisition as well as, as selling. So you see seaplanes and rescue planes with the Indians as you had that not very successful but interesting large mega submarine <laughs> bid with Australia, right? Um, and you've got conversations ongoing with the UK and various kinds of technology, right? Um, so in weapons enhancement, and I can see that developing into a two-way street where the Japanese are going to not only want to be part of a, a larger economy of scale for technology, weapons, military technology, right, globally, but they're going to want to partner more with Europeans. And I, you know, that next generation fighter um, is ripe for opportunity for people who really want to compete and who compete better, who can compete better than the UK uh, and France. <laughs> but you'll have competition coming from Europe, I think, to test the premise that the United States must be the main partner of Japan in some of these in some of these issues. But there's a lot more other than the big ticket weapons, right? There's other things along the way. You know, cyber. Mm -hmm. There's a whole host of areas where Japan and Europe uh, have mutual interest in the next generation of technologies, and especially those applied to for military use. So, I think those three things would be where I'd keep my eye on the ball. Um, and it's not just exercising and, you know, kind of readiness kinds of collaboration. It's also presence for normative, you know, sustenance of, of the order that we want to continue to see. And also this last technological innovation and its applications for the military. Uh, thank you. I, I don't want to take anything away from the other questions because we have some really pointed questions. But today, quick reactions that I think um, and to uh, specifically to, to, to some of the points you're making on, on the question of presence. Um, um, perhaps not many people know, but uh, the point you made, the, you know, the, 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 the little thing you mentioned about the um, uh, UN Security Council um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, resolution on North Korea. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first two countries to start implementing it were the UK and Japan. Right. Uh, when um, um, you have the first frigate going back um, to the Asia Pacific, joining the Japanese at the very beginning of the, of the activity. And, and perhaps at the same time, would you link the, well, I think for me it's interesting, is at the moment what you see is um, Europe going really far east, not as far east, but far eastward, right? Yeah. At the same time, Japan coming really far west because the deployment, the recent deployment in uh, uh, Hormuz for the intelligence gathering activity. I, I think they, 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 they kind of like nicely sort of encapsulate geographically and intellectually the point you were making about presence. That it, it has to be a two-way street and it's also a place there contrary to a not very far distant past. It's not the kind of place where Japan would say like, you're absolutely welcome to come our way. Yeah. Us coming there, well, we don't really know. Um, I think that's, that's actually quite an interesting development there. Um, and, and the other point about the technology aspect, absolutely. At, at the moment, I think the, the, the future, the next generation fighter jet is going to be a really interesting one to watch, uh, particularly in terms of the point you were making at connecting point one and point three. US Japan Alliance as a launching pad for Japan to do more, but the US Japan Alliance also as a something that the United States wants to cash in, if you want, at some point, because we've seen the pressure that Japan is getting right. on the selection process for the next generation fighter. So, Absolutely fascinating stuff, I'd say. But, yeah. but, 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 all but lots of opportunity, I think. You, and yeah. you can see it. And it, the, the, the critical piece is going to be how much is this going to be competition between, right, the UK, UK, for example, or France or whoever, and the United States, right? And where Japan starts to feel the pressure. But frankly, I think we probably did the Japanese a disservice by insisting that all their F-35s be built off the shelf by workers in Texas, right? Closing down production lines in Japan, if you're thinking of a longer term strategic asset, it's not a good idea. No. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help war fighting, it doesn't help anything. So if the United States still has that short time frame in mind, 
that more transactional approach to, to putting pressure on Japan on these things, I think you're going to see people who are going to be looking for alternatives. And, and the question of supply chains that we're all asking right now for a very different reason will play to the strength of the constituencies who politically argue for right. greater diversification and ability to produce at home to an extent, uh, because the time of crisis, that will make a fundamental difference. Now, on this point, or, or in particular, the, the, on one aspect that you mentioned, India, there's a question uh, that, that it's, uh, can nicely sort of tie into what we're talking about. Um, how do you see the India-Japan defense relationship developing, and what are the prospects for arm experts and join our developments? Sorry, I did get that last part. So, uh, what are the Japan Defense Cooperation? Arms experts, yeah, arms, arms experts and oh arms, de arms development. Um, so, I this is not an area where I have a, a deep knowledge. So, I'm just going to put that little flag out there, especially on the arms expert conversations that are currently ongoing with India. The one that I that I uh, did a little bit of research on was the sea plane. It was a sea rescue plane, right? Um, I think there's two pieces on the India Japan. The first, of course, is um, I remember the first time I went to, to, to New Delhi to talk about Japan and to talk about U.S. strategy and, you know, all that kind of stuff. This is pre-U.S. Japan-India collaboration on the Malabar exercises. So I think there was a certain idea that, that, that a certain table setting needed to happen. But I went and I talked to all kinds of Indian policymakers. Um, but I also talked to academics. And it was a fun conversation for me because... Uh, you know the the intellectual climate in India is 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 energizing for anybody, but for an American, it's particularly eye opening because it's not the conversation we typically have. But but you know, I was sitting around tables of people, experts, strategic experts, talking about. So Japan just needs uh, nuclear weapons. You know, <laughs> it needs to stop its relationship with the Americans and and get its independence. And you know, that's how we're going to counter China. And I was like. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, but it was it was fun for me because you'd never have that conversation in Tokyo, right? Oh. Um, <laughs> or we wouldn't probably. We may over a cup of, of of a glass of beer in the evening, but we would never have it as as an intellectual right debate no. in an academic setting. But um, so I think there's 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 different voices inside India to consider about expectations of Japan, and Japan will never, I think, fulfill the larger expectation of a strategic counterbalance to China on the other side, right? And and I think that's one of the one of the ways in which some of New Delhi strategists think about Japan. However, in the maritime space, they have moved pretty carefully towards slow and steady and conspicuous but not over the top implementation of the kinds of things I'm calling presence. So the Indians coming to East Asia, yeah. right, to, to, to exercise with the Japanese, the Japanese obviously going the other way, um, in Southeast Asia, exercising together, right? So you're starting to see a kind of integrative, this is not odd, you know, the same way Europeans were going East, the Indians have looked East and they have sent their small Navy, but nonetheless, they have participated in some interesting demonstrations that India's interests are also uh, in East Asia. So I think there's lots of ways in which the Japanese would like to similarly, maybe not have boots in the ground in India, but certainly continue their ground self-defense force staff dialogue, their air self-defense force staff dialogue. It's not all about the Navy. Um, and it's a lot about China. And it's a lot about, especially if we see what's going on now with China and India, um, I would expect some of that to intensify because part of it is um, the militaries, at least, want to be aware of the ways in which China is testing both countries, right? Mm -hmm. Not just allies of the United States, but the ways in which the, the Chinese are using their military power to test mm -hmm. and to look for reaction. Um, I think the, the one cautionary note on that relationship, of course, is that even Prime Minister Modi, uh, who has deeply embraced the Indo-Pacific strategy and the Japanese leg of that Indo-Pacific strategy, at least in, in rhetoric, right, and in commerce and in infrastructure and other things, um, even Prime Minister Modi is cautious about an India-Japan military mm. or being perceived as you know, trying to have a more military alliance with Japan. So I think New Delhi, uh, no matter who's in power, is always going to be careful about that because, of course, the China card plays large in, in, in India, even though we have a fairly similar strategic take on China at the moment. Um, it's, not going to be an, it's not going to be an incautious kind of embrace of Japan as a strategic partner. On the export side, again, I think it's still 
at a small scale, again, the search and rescue airplane is a good example. I don't think you're going to have destroyers being built. I think there's, an, you know, the, the Indian Navy is still, you know better than I, Alessio, but I think the Indian Navy is still not at the same level and scope as the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense mm -hmm. Force. I don't see major weapon systems being a focal mm -hmm. point anytime soon. But again, I'm, I'm happy to turn that back to you to comment on. Oh, yeah, no, I, I can agree more. I think th there was a very interesting point you were making there about, um, and I think in that sense, Australia, Japan, India are all similar in, in, in one way, as in they are all becoming particularly aware of the challenge that, and opportunities that China presents, but they're also very careful about giving a sort of a, an outright impression of containment. And, and the way the dynamics in the quad, for example, are, are panning out, it's, it's extremely interesting. Japan is very similar in behavior to India. It's very understanding when mm. India is reluctant to engage in quad-related. Um, although, at the same time, Japan has been very supportive of quad. In fact, they've been supporting if you know, if it makes you feel better to drop quote, then we call it multilateral, and we call yeah. someone else. By all <laughs> means, let's go for that. Um, yeah. On on the particular point that you were raising on 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 strategic, um, uh, strategic uh, deterrence, nuclear deterrence. Um, there's a question I have here about um, what do you think the concept of unacceptable dam damage applied to the U.S. Um, whether it would lead Japan to doubt the extended nuclear deterrence credibility, and, and if so, to what extent? Mm. So this is the part of the book that, again, would require my chapter, my, my conclusion is a small conclusion, and it's not a big, large, developed argument on when would Japan change, which is something I've been thinking about for a while, writing something separate. So there's two pieces uh, on the nuclear debate in Japan, and unless you, you're very familiar with this, but for your audience, um, one is people think that the Japanese have never considered a nuclear option, and that's just not true. So even going back to the diet debates that you and I were referencing earlier on, um, you know, kintai teki, <laughs> kintai teki senso, or modern war warfare, was the, the, the word that was being used in 1953 and 54 as the self-defense forces were being created, and that was a reference to nuclear weapons, right? Um, later on, you get into the 60s, the period that you were looking at diet debates in the Hatoyama period, right? Mm -hmm. You also get more, you know, are they, are they prohibited by Article 9? And the answer was no. Mm -hmm. If they were necessary for Japan's defense, we would have to consider them. That has always been the political predicate of a policy debate about whether they would good, be good for Japan's defense, right? So you see coming into, you know, when the Chinese developed the hydrogen bomb, you see that when Japan prepared to sign the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, you see it at the end of the Cold War, and then you saw it again um, more recently, there have been internal policy reviews, some of which have leaked out into the public. Uh, and the nuclear question is largely on the military side, Japan doesn't have strategic depth. Hmm. It's an archipelagic state. Basically, two of the what we think of as, as the nuclear triad, the survivability of a nuclear arsenal um, delivered by airplane and delivered by intercontinental ballistic missile, those would be taken out immediately because Japan doesn't have the strategic depth to maintain them. So if Japan sees its autonomy as being served by a nuclear platform, it would be an SLBM force. It would look an awful lot like the de Gaulle argument for a force to frap. It would probably not be a war fighting doctrine, right? Um, and so I always say, I mean, if you're sitting in Washington or New York, you know, I, when I launched the book with Richard Haas back in April last year, um, lots of questions about Japan going nuclear. Well, it has the scientists, it has the fissile material, although post 2011, we have a question mark there, but um, it certainly has the capability if it chose to, right? Mm. But it would have to choose to do so um, because it makes sense to enhance Japanese security, right? And so that calculus is what people don't normally think through. And in very rare circumstances, would that help Japan? Mm. And I think the political calculus has largely been our scientists may not participate in a weapons program. So there's the domestic politics side of that. There's the, you know, the military argument, the lack of strategic depth that I just rolled out. And then there's the other is it would simply attract, <laughs> you know, more attention and more pressure um, by the militaries of Japan's neighbors on Japan. The, the impetus for a, a strike on Japan to neutralize any capability would be overwhelmingly not in Japanese favor. So the logic of the nuclear deterrent as Japan's 
at least what has appeared in the public domain. I, I, I can't say anything about, I don't know. Um, none of the evidence points to uh, a, a real willingness. It would be a very reluctant choice by mm. Japan. And I don't even think it would be the first step if an alliance with the United States was no longer you know, the option for deterrence. I could very easily see that the Japan would try to find some accommodation with Beijing. And depending on the leadership in Beijing, they might find accommodation with Japan to be a preferable alternative than the arms race that a nuclear program would reveal. So people don't like to hear accommodation because it's a bad word. But it could, uh, you know, conceivably, you always have to think, what, is the, what are the other options? Well, the other options could be collective action, a la Indo-Pacific. Could be a combination with Beijing. Sure, it could be a nuclear weapon, but I don't think that's the first place the Japanese are going to go. Um, now, the unacceptable damage, not defending Japan from an attack, be it, be, be it North Korea or China. Those are the obvious ones, right? Um, Another unacceptable damage, I think, would be too much compromise with Beijing or North Korea. Um, some Japanese uh, foreign policy and security experts have come to Washington and said, if you, if you openly acknowledge North Korea as a nuclear power, the alliance is over. I don't think that's right, by the way. I think it, as we watched in South Asia, <laughs> we will adjust. I don't think it automatically cancels out the alliance. So I think you'd have to have a pretty stark declaration by the United States that it is no longer offering strategic protection to Japan for domestic politics reasons, for whatever calculus the United States would make that decision, or you'd have a, a failed US response to a serious threat against Japanese, uh, the Japanese home islands. Hard for us to imagine that we're actually talking about those two scenarios, but under the presidency of Donald Trump, frankly, they, they have become conceivable. And Alessio, you and I are probably, I'm not saying that Trump is doing that, by the way. But the language and the rhetoric that has been used by the US president has startled a lot of people mm. into, into thinking, oh, maybe we better start thinking <laughs> a little bit about the steps and the alternatives. Not that anybody wants a plan B, mm. they don't, right? And Abe has done everything possible to narrow the gap with President Trump on that. But again, I think it would have to be pretty convincingly obvious that the United States has failed Japan. And, and you know, in, in one sense, the point you were making about the facts, if anything, this pushes you towards starting considering what are the other options available out there. And you know, the CSBA report on uh, comparing Japanese and Chinese uh, maritime capability that came out last week, I think was yeah. very interesting because it points towards a space in terms of conventional capabilities where Japan can go, which would fit both in terms of options, its own territorial defense, as well as the alliance. And, you know, I've always said this for a while now, um, you know, Japanese submarines by design can operate T-LAMs, conventional T-LAMs, if the capability with position strike or uh, uh, satellite guided uh, position strike sort of option were available and acceptable politically. So there are places where Japan can go, as you were saying, that are very, very important without their nuclear question. But the ultimate option, as in like, do we have to go nuclear? In a way, prompts people mm -hmm. seriously about options other than that one, because you know that that is the one scenario that you really want to try to avoid. Right. And there's this assumption, and I think, and again, I'm not a nuclear strategist, but, but, but all of us have been schooled in the, the, the logic of nuclear deterrence if we've come up in this field. But um, there is, you know, it has to work. <laughs> I mean, the nuclear option can't just say, hi, we've got a weapon. I mean, it has to be a viable nuclear option. Um, and that's, that's where the questioning, as I can see it, what, 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 what available, you know, peaks in those windows of Japanese mm -hmm. thinking, both military, political, and strategic, um, you know, lar writ large, those people who have been thinking, it's not all that clear that a nuclear weapon would enhance Japanese security, given the neighborhood, given the territorial configuration of Japan, and given the fact that they're up against the Western Pacific on the other side, right? So maritime, conventional, um, much, much bigger maritime, right? <laughs> um, but you'd ha you, there, there, are, there is a lot of space that Japan still has yet to explore before it actually gets to that final, final declaration. And, and I'm not even sure that it would ever make sense for Japan to do it.
Um, but we did. We have not said anything about the standoff capability. You mentioned the submarines, and Japan has now uh, entered into the standoff strike capability, which will pull its ability to shoot further off offshore. Mm. You don't have to go far offshore of Japan to hit other countries, by the way, right? For those of you envisioning that mental map of Northeast Asia. Um, but I, I think offensive strike is not that far behind. I mean, a, a deep penetrating strike. And that's why I think it's going to be very interesting to watch the next year or two mm. to see what China um, is ready to tell Japan about its intentions towards Japan. Um, you, you're going to see Tokyo get pressure if it's a second Trump administration, even if it's not, but I think especially if it's a second Trump administration, you get an awful lot of pressure for these intermediate range ballistic missiles to be deployed, American missiles to be deployed in Japan. Now, whether they're dual key or dual control, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of interesting questions there for the alliance to, to tackle. Um, but I think there's a fairly significant political desire in Japan um, for their own missile capabilities. Uh, no, right? Absolutely. I, I, I would say that's exactly the impression that I've had now yeah. for the better part of the last year and a half. And precisely on the back of the point you were making that somehow the unpredictability of Trump is not making them question the alliance, but rather why the need to widen the realm of politically possible in defense terms instead of capabilities are absolutely within that part of the debate. So for that very reason, it seems a sensible way of thinking. And as a result of that, also one that is likely to remain on the agenda, if not increase, given also where the sort of uh, uh, US-China relationship is going. And, and that seems to be regardless of whether it's going to be a, a second Trump presidency or a Biden presidency, given how the debate over China is going. Now, I'm conscious of the time, and I want to sort of try to tie things together, because there's two questions okay. that okay. Bring, uh, back um, to a point you were mentioning earlier, there's, and, and, and then I'll, I'll, there's one final question that I think it's, it's perfectly suited for sort of drawing this to a close. So the first two, I'll bring them together. Um, the, the rise of, of Kante-led, if you want, diplomacy um, has showed to have some limitations and the COVID crisis perhaps has highlighted that. At the same time, uh, bureaucracy is not, uh, it is said to be declining as, 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 as a force that was driving Japanese policy action. Given the current uh, socio-economic situation of Japan, which do you think would work better as we move forward? Politician-led diplomacy or bureaucrat-led diplomacy, or whether sort of find a balance, or whether the NSS will become sort of like a, something in between? And slightly related, because it's always about the domestic politics in Japan, there's another question here about how do you see the future of the constitutional reinterpretation within the current sort of political configuration uh, uh, to go? Particularly, the question is asking about whether there will be a popular support for a referendum over the change of the constitution. Or has the Abe legacy become one in which we can do stuff without actually going to that constitutional revision? Or as James Scoff has always uh, sort of uh, pointed out, have we reached the plateau and therefore constitutional revision is then necessary? So two questions on, on domestic politics, very relevant. One, where's the balance between bureaucracy and Kante? The other one, how we reach the end of the rope for reinterpretation? And is there appetite, publicly anyway, in, in more the public sphere for, 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 a, for a referendum on uh, con constitutional changes? And that's the final question? Okay, good. I thought, so is um, that like, a, like, a, like a, the two pre-final? There's a one right final okay. that will draw everything together. Okay, so on the Kante versus bureaucracy, um, you know, you, 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 you have, you're, you're sitting in London. <laughs> Your audience knows this better than anybody. Um, in the Westminster system, right, the bureaucracy and the, the politicians and party, right, it's a constant tug of war. It's the same, and it's a parliamentary system in Japan. It's constituted the same way. Um, you can't draw on the public for your presidential race. So the dynamics of electoral politics are actually structured in a way that gives the bureaucracy a, a nice counterweight to the politicians, uh, but it also gives the party a great counterweight to the bureaucracy, right? So um, I think that's, that's gonna continue. I don't think anything has gone one way or gone the other. I think what's been noticeable about Kante-led diplomacy is you've had several prime ministers 
who have used it well. And I would say, even before we use the word Kante diplomacy, somebody you mentioned much earlier in our conversation, Nakasone, used it extraordinarily well. Mm. Um, if you have a political leader in Japan who is savvy, interested, and effective on the international stage, and is a strategic thinker writ large, not necessarily just military, but strategic about Japan's place in the world and what Japan needs to accomplish to, to, to prosper. I, I, you know, those kinds of prime ministers, I would put Hashimoto as another one, mm. although he didn't effectively translate everything that he wanted to get done. He did do the administrative reform piece, which really upended some of the bureaucratic grip on power. So mm. you've, you've got successive Japanese prime ministers who've managed to tease that balance a bit, to restructure it, Koizumi was the classic, right, in terms of do you want, you know, 120,000 bureaucrats determining your life? That was his electoral slogan, right? So he, I think, very effectively got the Japanese public to understand their political leaders needed to step up and could step up to the challenge of leading Japan. They didn't have to turn to the Todai educated or Kyodai educated bureaucrats, right, anymore. Um, the bureaucracy has not distinguished itself at moments, right? And it has also come down a little bit, I think, in the estimation of the Japanese public. Lots of scandals, corruption, things like that. So I think you're gonna still see this tug and pull. I think bureaucrats and politicians are still gonna define it that way. I think the interesting thing about the, this last tenure of Abe is there's a law now in place. Yes. right that gives the political leader of japan the ability to determine whether somebody's a director general or above in the bureaucracy that is a fatal blow to the bureaucracy frankly it is a great coup <laughs> by the political elite so the future careers of bureaucrats will no longer be protected from the political will of who's elected and that's pretty key that's pretty important so i think there is greater leverage now from the pol political side, but I think the tug and pull is gonna continue to be there. Um, the constitutional question, we have a, I hate to advertise CFR work, but I'll do it. Um, we have an info guide that I worked on um, last year. It's called Japan's Constitutional Debate. For those of you who are teaching, it's a great tool. It was meant to be a tool, but rather for people who are not Japan experts or not even could be Japan interested, but not constitution experts. So it's got three sections, the history, which we all know. Um, but it's also got a section on legislative change, changes over the, ref, the revision debate. And some people are surprised. They don't remember that the DPJ had a platform for constitutional revision, um, that Japanese newspapers got in the game, that there was a whole up, up, uptick of debate over revision. Not all of it, not most of it, not about Article 9, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last is obviously the public opinion piece. But um, I think revision is coming. I think it's more likely when Abe is not prime minister for all of his advocacy mm -hmm. of, you know, the origins debate and this is, you know, drafted by foreigners in eight days, need to Japanese debate. I, I think lots of people actually would enjoy a conversation. Um, the article nine piece is the hard one. Hmm. And the minute at which constitution, the revision of the collective self-defense force interpretation was made in 2014 by the Abe cabinet, you start to see public opinion drop way down. And that was Yomiuri and Asahi, left and right, right, center, left and right, drop way down for revision after that defense reinterpretation had happened. So I think Article 9 is always going to be hard, very hard. Um, but I think the larger, writ large, the Japanese debate over do we need privacy rights? Should we have the state involved in um, education to a larger responsibility? Should we have Emergency Powers Act that allows the executive branch to respond to an emergency? These are the issues now on the table that have nothing to do with Article 9, and I think we're going to see that debate happen. I tend to be, uh, I, I think, reinterpretation. I think we're done. Yeah. With CSD, I, I don't. Jim, is, Jim, and I are probably in a pretty, pretty much the same page. I'm not quite sure why he's at that page, but I'm at that page because um, I don't see any other political party out there um, that would be willing to use reinterpretation. And even Japan's, let's call them the hawks, to be to be shorthanded about it. Um, people like Ishiba Shigeru, they would rather revise hmm. Article Nine than to tweak. And you know, Ishiba and I have talked about this many times, but he's also written about it extensively. He said, it's not a time for Japan to be ambiguous. Hmm. People need to understand when and how we're gonna use force, if we're gonna use force. Hmm. And we ought to stop hiding behind Article 9 and be clear <laughs> about our ability and willingness to defend ourselves, for example. Hmm. Now, he doesn't take that in a big direction that says, you know, we're, we're gonna get rid of Article 9. 
But I think the people who are more inclined towards communicating Japanese intentions would rather rewrite than reinterpret. And that's where the push is going to come from, right? It's not, it's not going to come from anybody else but from there. And the Japanese people may or may not support that. But mm -hmm. I don't think reinterpretation gives people what they really want, which is clarity. Which leads us to the very last question, which I think is a very good question. And in a way, it allows us to bring together and, and sort of it takes us to uh, some points you raise in the conclusions of the book. Um, threat perception. To what extent do you think Japan and US are currently on the same page in terms of threat perception? And in, perhaps in a slightly more even abstract way, um, is it even possible? Do they need to be on the same page? And if not, um, is that sort of, what are the parameters for the Alliance to continue to grow um, in, in practical and operational terms in, when it comes to threat perception? How much of this alignment, if you want, um, is good for the Alliance to continue to grow? And I think that's an important question, especially yeah, as we head towards a sort of Abe losing his grip to power and of course uh, the elections coming up in the United States. So what are we in the, in the, in the sense of threat perception and where, where should we be um, as we move forward? So it's a great question. Um, I'll, because we don't have much time, I'll try to be succinct. Um, so one of the big points of difference I was feeling in the Japan US uh, policy conversation uh, during the latter Obama years was over this question of China, right? And um, mm. there was a lot of, you know, you know, the United, a lot of critique that the United States was too focused on solving all its problems with China, and China had to come first, and G two, and all that kind of stuff. Some of it was personally directed at Susan Rice, but I think there was an um, there was an underlying sense. And you could feel this in the Self Defense Force. You could feel it across different interest groups. So it wasn't just a personality issue, right? Um, and that is Japan overwhelmingly sees its long-term existential threat as China, overwhelmingly, mm -hmm. despite the missiles from North Korea and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the American, having the United States and Japan on the same page is, is something felt viscerally by the Japanese policy community, not just the conservatives, right? But uh, most of them are uh, aligned more on the conservative side of politics, but, but it is by almost everybody, right? Um, if the Chinese come, would the Americans really hold us you know, will this alliance hold, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a suspicion of long-term, you know, a long view of the U.S.-Japan post-war alliance that goes back to the Nixon shocks, right? And the opening to China. And there's, uh, fingers have been burnt in the past over differing tempos and willingness to embrace Beijing, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's also a split in the conservatives among those who see China as a potential economic partner if a strategic challenge to Japan versus the anti-communist folks who are more focused on the ideological proclivities of the leadership in Beijing. And that strain is, is, is used to define um, China policy. It doesn't so much anymore, but it's still there. So as you watch Hong Kong and as you watch the over, spillover to Taiwan, I would pay attention to what you're starting to hear from different quarters in Japan about whether or not that constitutes a challenge, right, to Japanese identity, to Japanese way, to democracy, right? So be prepared for a little bit of parsing between the Chinese military coming and then the democratic values piece. Uh, that's going to come. But I think the, so that's, that's where we're going to have a challenge, whether it's President Trump or President Biden, I think we're going to continue to have that challenge. There'll be very deep sensitivity in Tokyo about Washington's approach to China and vice versa. Even the the, the planned state visit uh, by Xi in April inside the Beltway, there was a like, mm, what kind of agreement are they going to sign? What are they going to compromise? So it's a place of alertness and suspicion, not suspicion, it's too strong a word, but alertness to the, the, what's historically been a slightly different way of dealing with, with mm -hmm. Beijing, right? Um, there was a very interesting piece. If you, you, I'm sure you've read it. If your listeners haven't, you should read it. It's in the national interest. Uh, and it's an anonymous Japanese government official. Well, yes, I saw it. Yes. And it's, um, you know, it's got initials that look an awful lot like Mr. Yachi's. Um, <laughs> who, who knows? Um, but anyway, it's basically that oh, we, we're not up for engagement. Thank you very much. Even smart engagement. We want straight on confrontational, American confrontational 
approach to China. And even if it's badly implemented, i.e. even if it's a Trump <laughs> badly implemented strategy, we'd rather have that than have a sophisticated engagement strategy that was well implemented. So that's a signal loud and clear, right, across the, across the deck <laughs> for the coming November election. Um, and it's basically telling the insiders in Washington, we want the hard line. We want you to be hard line. We want, we're not, no more engagement, thank you very much. Um, so that's the China sensitivity, it's still there. I would say there's other pieces under the radar though, of, of the China radar. North Korea, I think, is still a question. It goes right to the heart of the extended deterrent. Uh, I think um, Abe navigated the relationship with Trump quite well, mm. fire and fury and into, you know, you know Singapore and Hanoi. Uh, but the, re the reality is Japan doesn't have a horse in Pyongyang, right? Until Abe can have a direct dialogue or Abe's successor, it's not sitting at the table mm. in, in current Northeast Asia when it comes to the future of North Korea. So I think that's still there, not just the missile threat, but the the what's the negotiating approach. Um, and then there's Russia. Hmm. Yep. And especially, we haven't talked a lot about it, but there's an awful lot of increasing demonstration that Russia and China are quite willing to exercise together to test the Japanese and the South Koreans in the middle of their you know, deteriorating relationship to test Dokuto or Takeshima, right? I mean, to play. Uh, in a bad way <laughs> with the uh, military balance in the region. And I think the Russians, um, you know, Air Self-Defense Force uh, pilots will tell me, we know the Russians. We've known them from the Cold War. We scramble. We know how they're going to behave. The Chinese, less predictable. But you're starting to see a deeper concern about Russian-Chinese collusion mm -hmm. and cooperation. Um, and I think you see it in the exercising. You see it in the scrambles. You see it in the readiness. And I think that's something um, that Abe has not managed to do. And I don't want to call it a failure, but the, the, the discussions with Putin have not led where Abe had really wanted them to lead, which was not necessarily territorial response, but at least inviting Russia a little bit back from too much cooperation strategically with China. So uh, you noticed in December 2018, the, next, the last Tycho, the last 10-year defense plan, Russia was on the threat perception list, was on the, for the first time named. Hmm. And that was done to say, okay, America, you're worried about the Russian behavior. We understand that. As hmm. long as you're worried about the Chinese with us, we'll worry about the Russians with you. And I think that was an interesting indicator to me um, that there's a, a, hmm. there was an active attempt to make the United States and Japan look a little bit more that they were on the same page in terms of threat perception. So long answer. Um, I think we need to at least understand each other's threat perception and where the varying degrees of behaviors that we would think were not acceptable. Uh, I'm not sure that we're there yet in this particular political moment in the United States. And I think the COVID-19 confusion raised can, will, will require some resetting of, of, of Tokyo and Washington's perceptions about what's coming as we move out of this, right? Wonderful. I mean, thank you. This was absolutely fascinating. I think we could sort of continue and carry on uh, conversing about this for, for another 10 hours, but that <laughs> would be uh, tantamount for me hijacking your life. So I shall not do that. Um, but for all those who want to continue to learn about this question, learn about uh, Japan's role in the region, how it is evolving, and sort of um, have some foundations or consolidate their foundations uh, um, as we move forward uh, with this debate. I can recommend uh, Sheila's book more. And um, other than that, um, thank you very much, Sheila, for taking the time to join us today to talk about uh, uh, the themes in the book and how relevant and timely they continue to be. Um, and thank you everybody um, for uh, uh, staying with us for a little longer uh, than we anticipated, but the conversation was so good that I couldn't possibly stop it. Um, so I apologize to those who had to dash off. Um, and the um, recording of the session will be available um, shortly thereafter on our YouTube channel at Warsaw the King's College London. Other than that, um, please stay tuned, follow us on Twitter, and keep an eye out. We'll be back with other new webinars, a new book to recommend you. Other than that, thank you very much, Sheila. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you.